Hi, I'm Christopher Schneeberger, and you're watching For Art's Sake. Hi, I'm Christopher Schneeberger. Uh, I'm a photographer and curator from Chicago, Illinois, and uh, I was invited to curate a show here at the Geertz Gallery. Um, in considering possible artists for the show, um, two artists that work in tandem, uh, who are favorites of mine, occurred to me as a basis for the show, and that would be Laura Shipley and Anton Dalzal, who have done this project uh, called the Spook Light, Spook Light Chronicles. Um, they are both from the Ozarks region, um, which spans several states, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and they've returned to that region a number of times over the years and made photographs together. Uh, the, the title, Spook Light Chronicles, comes from uh, kind of local mythology about a, a mysterious light that might appear to you if you go down a certain road and wait at a certain time of night. They didn't really set out to prove or disprove that phenomenon, but instead use that as a basis to just explore the culture of the area. And they've made this wonderful project which encompasses aspects of the landscape and portraiture and vignettes um, that I think really kind of capture a sense of the um, almost, almost kind of southern gothic feel and, and even sort of the humidity of the place. Um, you will notice that in a number of photographs there is a strong sense of light. Light has a presence in the, in the work, even though it may not be that uh, so named spook light um, piece, but you see it in these images here of the revival tent and the bluffs and uh, maybe this, uh, the, the car coming along the road. Uh, but it's a case where they've really invested themselves into one place and gone there and been there and tried to sort of tune into the frequency of that place and respond to it in a very personal way. Uh, so this is one of my favorite works in the show, The Spook Light Road. And you have a number of light sources in this picture. There seems to be the most obvious one maybe is this light coming, perhaps it's a car driving along the road toward us, or is it this mysterious spook light for which the series is named? There's obviously then also uh, a light in the foreground, perhaps from a, a car uh, headlights here. There may be some other kind of eerie blue-green light that's drifting in across the trees. But then the thing that really hooks me um, is this little shadow that's creeping in from the left side, that there's someone perhaps standing just off stage, as it were, uh, maybe waiting for this spook light. And, and that refers to this uh, mythology about uh, a mysterious light, uh, a glowing orb that would float down uh, a road uh, through a wooded area in an area where it's said that the devil resides. And it's said that if you drive into this area and park on a road and wait, um, that you may see this light come floating down the road. Uh, I just want to talk about this, this particular trio uh, of images is really terrific. It's black and white, uh, all three of them. They work in both black and white in color. Uh, this in particular is an interesting kind of vertical diptych because uh, here we have this glow that's coming from a, a tent revival um, where some kind of a, a, you know, a church service has been being held. Um, and, but above that is this uh, hand, sort of disembodied hand, uh, holding a, a snake out above uh, a scene. Uh, and it just reminds me to a degree of uh, serpent handling um, as part of a, a deep southern kind of uh, sense of religion. And I think this, these two go well together. But then that's counterbalanced in, in a way by this scene, which you know, during the day would probably be a very uh, uh, bucolic, pretty sort of scene, but in the, in the lights of perhaps headlights of a car, uh, slightly underlit, th this bluff becomes quite spooky. And in addition to the, the, the rocks and the trees here, there's this shadow that's cast upward from the trees into what I, I'm not even really sure, it, or maybe clouds or, or fog or something above that catch a little bit of that um, light, and I think it, it kind of goes to that sort of um, mysterious, maybe slightly dark undercurrent that, that runs through this work and maybe through this culture. All right, well, this is the work of John Horvath and from a series called This is Bliss, and I saw John give a lecture at a conference last year 
about this series. Um, Bliss, in this case, um, is the name of a town, a small town in Idaho uh, that's not too far off of like an interstate. Um, and he's gone to this pretty small town a number of times and uh, also sort of resided there, taken up sort of somewhat of a residency and gotten to know people in town and, and made photographs of this town kind of responding to its particular vibe. And I think what I see in, in this work, uh, I think what John is interested in to a degree is there's hints of, of this, um, uh, the American West, the romance of the American West, but, but the kind of faded nature of that um, hope and promise of, of it. Um, but he's, he's encompassing uh, both landscape and, and, and portraiture and people and responding to uh, things like uh, a vignette, let's say a, a, in this case, uh, this image called Cowboy Boot. And we see the interior of a sort of wood panel, the imitation wood paneled room and a bare mattress. Looks pretty threadbare at that, uh, with stains. And there's a cowboy boot laying here. Uh, and here again, you know, it's like it's a, an icon of that, that myth of the American West, um, but left kind of alone and dusty. And out the window, we see uh, a typical kind of diner sign, eat with the fork and knife and spoon symbol. The window is broken. I mean, it's all sort of about what, what the hope was of something and what the reality uh, is now. So in this work, which is called a uh, point of entry, point of exit, um, we see almost a, a grid typology of uh, the ways in and out of this small town. And, and small, when I say small, 300 residents or so of this town. Um, so the point of entry and points of exit are in some ways unremarkable. In other ways, they are kind of um, the, the classic vision of the American Western landscape, but seen with man's presence on the, on the land and the boundaries and barriers that we construct um, to enter and, and exit this particular place. Uh, this is maybe in a way a, a companion piece to a video component of the show, um, which shows a, a sort of eerie nighttime drive down uh, dusty gravel roads uh, through the town of Bliss without any particular destination. This piece titled Lucky Mike, uh, we imagine of course that that's the eponymous Lucky Mike that we see looking at his car. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's so lucky at that moment. Uh, maybe he's got car trouble. Um, the car that he's looking into is uh, a fairly dated sedan, maybe around the late 70s, early 80s or something like that. And I think all of that just kind of speaks to um, the passage of time and the uh, maybe previous uh, hope and glory of a town like this in the American West and, and where it's ended up now. So this is the work of Dave Giordano. Uh, Dave Giordano grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and though he lives in Chicago now, he's uh, done a, a project for a number of years where he's gone back and revisited Detroit and observed its resilience in the face of kind of a fading post-industrial uh, moment in its history. Uh, this particular grouping, which is uh, pretty recent in his series, has a sub-theme, which is that we're looking more or less at residents' front yards and front doors, um, these sort of liminal spaces between the public sidewalk and the more personal interior space, um, which serve both as a way for the residents to project their own identity to the, to the public, and also this almost kind of stage where um, they exist and, and maybe um, exhibit some, some pride of, of their um, residence and existence. So you see, you know, some that are, that are pretty hard scrabble, and, and then yet we have this one which is rather ostentatious, and it's uh, this kind of chrome painted rock and the lion sculpture, and there's, uh, I don't know, something of a, a royal quality almost to that uh, facade. Um, and others, here we have uh, uh, T. Rose and, and Claire selling puppies. I don't know that that is their front yard, but they seem to be at least, you know, sort of out on the front yard, and this is their uh, business, perhaps, is to, to sell puppies to the neighborhood. Um, in this image here, a uh, jewel with flag, uh, I think that, that flag is such a, a potent and, and loaded symbol, um, but maybe representing, you know, the, the unfulfilled promise of uh, the nation to uh, that resident or, or that community. This work is uh, by Christine Carr, a professor at Iowa State University, and it's 
easily the, the most colorful work of the show. Uh, it's stuff that just visually arrests me. Uh, the work is looking at concrete structures uh, of varying kinds, some very utilitarian, uh, somewhat out of context, uh, photographed entirely in the evening, uh, dimmer hours when artificial lights take effect, and you have in most of these a mixture of different color temperature light sources. Through her lens, I think these become these somewhat uh, uh, monumental, brutalist sculptures that are uh, you know, out of context. We don't quite know what their purpose is. Um, and so in, into that, you can just sort of imagine all kinds of things. They have, I think, to me, a dystopian quality about them. They're eerie. Uh, they're imposing. They're almost threatening in, in, in ways, but they're also very beautiful. Uh, Christine's work, I will say, is, is somewhat of an outlier for the show because these are not all done in one specific place, but they are about place, and they are about a place perhaps that only exists uh, in maybe the you know, abstraction of imagination when we pull them all together. This one in particular uh, it was a favorite of mine because of the mixture of the colors of light. And uh, you know, we get used to different sources of light and don't really necessarily distinguish them unless you're a photographer who thinks about this kind of stuff. Uh, but what you have here is most likely uh, sodium vapor light, which is a typical inexpensive street light that has a very orange color to it coming from the right side and perhaps a mercury vapor light, which is another kind of street light or security light, uh, giving a greenish glow over here. Uh, and perhaps that's a little bit exaggerated in, in the uh, photography or the editing. But that's also complemented by this very beautiful, cool blue sky of the evening uh, with that. Um, you know, what are we looking at? I, I think it may be a spiral ramp to a parking garage or something, but it, it's uh, devoid of its context and it's got this beautiful, almost um, crying, uh, uh, dissolving, melting quality with the stains on the concrete from years of rain and, and whatever. It, with this image, I feel, you know, abstraction, I think we, we often misunderstand to be uh, something that's completely unidentifiable. Uh, I think the abstraction is taking the familiar and making it less familiar or unfamiliar. And here, I think within, you know, a, a not too long, a few seconds, maybe a minute, you recognize that we are looking up one corner of a, of a building. But for maybe a moment, in trying to work out what this is, it becomes a pyramid. Um, it's a monument of varying kinds. There's a pattern here that seems to read diagonally as opposed to vertically. But then the kicker for me is twofold. One is, at the very peak of this pyramid is a security light, the you know, ubiquitous imposing, all-seeing, big brother eye uh, looking down at us. Maybe, in a way, as I think about pyramids and eyes like that Masonic symbol of the eye in the pyramid, um, but then also this cloud drift above, which is captured perhaps through a, a long exposure and it's sort of streaking by, uh, maybe really em emphasizing the permanence of this structure with the impermanence of the, the sky moving. So this work is by Samantha Van Diemen. And Samantha has, for a number of years, uh, sought out and found entry into abandoned hotels. And we're not generally talking about just your typical, you know, Super 8 motels, but uh, at least hotels that were at one time destination resort sort of hotels. And what I really enjoy about these, uh, the colors are terrific. I think there's a, a beautiful sense of light in these pictures but also that they are not spaces that are so decrepit uh, that they might fall into what we often term ruin porn. These are spaces that you could believe that they were just left, you know, a month or a year ago and they've barely been touched, that they could almost be, you know, renovated right back into being uh, terrific spaces, that they're not so far gone. One of my favorites in this series is this uh, one in the upper right, uh, it's a uh, dining hall uh, at a hotel in, in uh, New, York, New York, New York State. And what I see here is a really beautiful ballroom kind of space with a stage. Um, you could imagine, you know, lavish affairs, galas going on at this place. And, and at some point, you see stacked here back up on the stage are all the chairs perhaps of that dining hall. 
And someone you know, must have taken great care at some point to stack all those up, not only just to get them out of the way, but maybe to protect them uh, for future use. I see within that maybe the hope that this place might reopen or might be sold and might, might come back to its glory day. And yet then for me the kicker is lurking almost off frame on the right is a, a mattress with a sheet on it and clearly someone has uh, spent a night there or at least maybe used it as a squat at some point. One of the factors that I love in, in this work is the light and in these two it, it's pretty obvious this these rooms that, that have no uh, light on inside, the electricity is turned off, there's no internal illumination, but then through some little gap in the blinds or some window that's off frame, uh, there's a little bit of direct, probably late afternoon or early morning sunlight that's coming in. And uh, for me, that maybe resonates with the idea of hope of the place, you know, in its former glory or, or the spotlight that once shone metaphorically on this place as a destination. Then you have an image like this, and, and the light isn't quite as dramatic. You don't have uh, a singular shaft of light, but this very soft, nevertheless concentrated pool glow of light here on the wall. And what really hooks me in this picture um, is this framed uh, print up on the wall of two zebras galloping. And though this is uh, a hotel in uh, New York, uh, Adirondacks or something, um, someone has thought about the, the romance and the allure of travel and the idea of you know, being somewhere exotic, you know, maybe in Africa, to see zebras galloping across the uh, savanna. Well, this work is by Jason Roblando, and when Jason lived in Chicago when he was doing his uh, graduate studies, um, he became interested in the Lathrop Homes, which was a um, planned public housing project that was built, I think, in the 20s or 30s in Chicago, a low-rise housing project, and uh, has existed for many years. It's now actually, unfortunately, closed and being renovated to something else. But anyway, he's, he spent uh, a number of years going back to the homes uh, on a weekly basis, making photographs of people and the landscape of the community, which was a park city uh, kind of community. Uh, very progressive thinking went into the design of this place. But uh, he got to know a lot of people there, and as he went back and, and returned with photographs, he got to meet more people and um, gain an understanding of the community and made these photographs that responded not only to the physical place and the layout, but also the residents. Uh, and here we see uh, Angel uh, standing by his car, uh, uh, you know, some, someone else sitting in the, in the passenger seat uh, along one of the streets through the neighborhood. Um, what I really love in this one is uh, you know, the, 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 the camera is lower than his eye level. Looking up, up at him, he could read as intimidating, and yet he's got his arms tucked inside his shirt the way you know, a child might. Uh, for warmth or just to be playful. Uh, below that is one of my favorite images in this, uh, Yolanda re reclining. And it has almost kind of a, a Renaissance um, pose and, and the, the sitter of this portrait has such dignity uh, in, in the way she's posed and her confident like look off into the sunset uh, with the homes uh, behind her. I just think it's a, a, a stunning and very kind of honest portrait I just love this one uh, because I think it, it talks about people making the best of a situation and you know people who are living in public housing projects are obviously uh, on hard times to a degree and here seems to be a nice warm autumn day and a couple of residents of the homes have decided to get a long extension cord and get the TV right out into uh, the the patio atrium area between their buildings and, and watch the game or whatever it might be uh, in, in the nice uh, weather. And you can sort of imagine that what they're sitting on, which is now asphalt, uh, somewhat cracked and, and faded uh, of its paint, you know, was probably at one time a, a more of a kind of a garden space. When I was asked to curate this show for Geertz Gallery, I, d I decided to focus on artists who really responded to place. I think that uh, the place that an artist resides is always going to have an impact on the work that they make. And these artists are artists who have chosen to make that part of it a deliberate act, to go and take up residency to some degree uh, in a place and respond to that place and sort of tune into its frequency.